both. Okay, hi everyone. We're very happy today that we have Professor Altaf Nizamani and his student Kirat Iqbal from the University of Sindh in Pakistan who are going to tell us about quantum technology with trapped ions. So uh, can I share my screen? Please go ahead. Okay, sure. Okay, so it's going to share, hopefully. Can you see my screen as well? Yes. Okay. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Professor Isham, uh, inviting me to uh, this having a nice chit chat with you guys there. So first of all, let me introduce myself. I am Dr. Altaf Nizamani. I am Associate Professor at University of St. Jamshir, and I was uh, ex member of Iron Quantum Technology Group at University of Sussex, Brighton, UK. And where did I, I also did my postdoc in quantum sensing as well. With me today, uh, there's my graduate students, uh, Kira Tikbal, and she will, uh, she will give some presentation on the uh, quantum sensing as well with trap time. So yes, from title, we are, you can see this quantum technology with trap time. So first of all, Okay, uh, next slide. Okay, so just starting with the Richard Feynman's famous quotation, nature is in classical. And if you want to make a simulation of nature, you would better make it quantum mechanical. So I'm just talking, start from the bit history. So we know that there's a first quantum revolution in which we have a, a quantum technology based stuff like LED, computers, lasers, all these G GPS system, everything is all about the first quantum revolution. So quantum technology based on the laws of quantum mechanics. So, but now we are talking about the second revolution, second quantum revolution activity. So with, the, with quantum theory now fully established, we are required to look at the world in a fundamental new way. So yes, you all are quantum scientists, so it doesn't uh, make sense to, give these things to you, but just starting my talk. So objects can be in different states at the same time. And we call this in quantum thing is called a superposition. So, and the other thing is can, uh, two things can be deeply connected without any direct physical interaction. And that is, we call this entanglement. So utilizing these uh, two quantum phenomena, our new technologies are actually based on these quantum uh, superposition and quantum entanglement. And this, that's why what, what we call it this like a quantum, second quantum revolution. So what is the scope of quantum technology? So these technologies based on the laws of quantum mechanics, far reaching applications, they include secure communication networks, sensitive sensors and limit timing applications, fundamentally new paradigm of computation and many more. So quantum technology could result in a revolutionary improvement in terms of capacity, sensitivity, and speed. And we all are know that because governments and companies worldwide, including Google, Microsoft, Intel, IBM, they are investing heavily to unleash their, their potential. So yes, quantum computers that are ex expected to be able to solve problems that are unsolvable by the supercomputers of today and tomorrow. Other bit is the quantum cryptography. Based on quantum coherence, data can be protected in a completely secure way that makes AVC dropping impossible. And the quantum sensors and metrology. This is offshoot of, I would say, offshoot of this uh, current quantum technology. So using these uh, trapped ions or any quantum system, we can make a very uh, precise clocks and uh, sensor, sensors. So these sensors can be a magnetic field sensors, electric field sensors, even gravity sensors with unprecedented sensitivity and accuracy. So first of all, we all are familiar with the quantum technology, the existing quantum technology based on, you know, that transistors and these things. So for every passing year, we are just reducing, reducing the size of these chips. And now we are at the level that means uh, classical physics is just overcome by the laws of quantum mechanics. So this is very famous Moore's law that says that the number of transistors in a dense integrated system, IC, doubles about every two years. 
and the power of the CPU increased. So means now we are just end of the Moore's law. So Moore's law is going to be breakable. Or already I would say it's uh, in the breaking position that we, you, we can't further reduce the size of uh, these quantum chips. So we have to look for paradigm shift in con computing stuff. So for this, so we know that two bits are there and that these quantum bits, uh, it, they, they are different in a way that because they can achieve the mix state because we know that classical bits are having on zero or one, but two bits can happen be in zero, one, or maybe the superposition of both is stuff. Okay, so this is just like a, some graph graphics about the how it would work. So we know that a quantum computer with n spin requires to power n numbers to describe the state of the system. So just it it will be the very powerful tool if we have some hundreds of qubits there. But the problem is that how yeah how or what do you physically require? to implement a quantum computer. So we basically need a controllable two-level system, also known as an artificial atom, or there are many different systems in which they can be realized. So now I would talk, is talking about the more uh, technology stuff, hardware stuff about the quantum technology. So we know that individual atoms and photons can be a potential candidate for qubits. Atoms in optical lattice are cavity QED. Superconductors, so right now, I think Google and IBM, they are using the superconductor qubits. Semiconductors, quantum dots, and other condensed matter like single atom impurity in glass or NV centers, and nuclear magnetic resonance quantum computing, NMRQC. So these are some hardware candidates for realizing the quantum bits. But I would focus on individual atoms because every technology has some advantages and disadvantages. So things experimental worry about actually the, the code, the criteria, which should be fulfilled for to realize the full age quantum computer known as Jeevan Shinzo criteria. So the system should be scalable physical system with well-defined qubits, be initializable to a pure state, have a long enough coherence time, have a universal set of quantum gates, and permit high quantum efficiency qubit specific measurements. So for example, we know that photonic systems are very long lived qubits, but they cannot be scalable. So every uh, physical setup has their advantages and disadvantages. So I'm focusing on trapped ions, which are the one of the best candidate to be a scalable quantum computer. So trapped ions, so one of the best approach. So I can, uh, ions can be trapped by an electromagnetic field in a space and their quantum state could be measured and controlled. So this work actually, I would say started from uh, uh, with Wolfgang Paul who designed and who uh, invented, I would say a Paul trap in which we can trap ions. And recently uh, in 2012, we can, uh, have a Nobel Prize for quantum computing stuff or quantum mechanical system using the individual ions. So how the trapped ion as a qubit works. So ions interact strongly via the Coulomb interaction and can be trapped by electrical or magnetic fields. They have the very long coherence times. They have the hyperfine transitions, which gives definitely mm -hmm. long coherence time. They can be very well-defined initializations. Or we call it a state preparation. I will describe later on. And the measurement state, state read out by a laser induced fluorescence. And high fidelity one, two, three qubit gates have been experimentally demonstrated already. Okay, and these trapped ions are not only the localized in one space. The, the, the chips or traps can be made a scalable level so that they can uh, create thousands of qubits. So ion trapping, just going to the fundamental of ion trapping. So now, now I'm describing how to trap an ion. So if we apply a positive, because we know that ion is a positive charge, positive atom, or ionized atom, we'd say. So it means if, if we apply field from every direction, we can trap it, but there's the ion charge theorem, which is, says that it is not possible to create a static electric field that traps the charge particle in all three directions. So how we then trap this? So this is some videos. We can see that, for example, we have a, horn there, and if I put a ball in center of it, everyone can tell me that this ball can fall down. But if we start to rotate the saddle,
and here we can see that now the ball is top over there. So this rotation field or rotation potential can trap the particles like this ball uh, trapped on, on a saddle. And similarly, so this kind of potential would be created to trap the particles. So we replace this ball with charge items and this saddle with the rotating electric field. So we call this kind of trap known as Paul trap. Mm -hmm. So in the Paul trap, we can see that there's the electrodes. So this red electrodes are RF electrodes, which would create the rotating electric field around it, and the DC fields mm -hmm. which would confine in one direction. So this is the combination of uh, electric field potential which trap charged particles in axial direction and in the radial direction. And then we apply lasers to cool these atoms down to ground state. So this is another demonstration, a uh, macroscopic level demonstration, I would say. So now we can see that electric oscillating electric field is applied on the dust charged particles. Because dust is being charged by rubbing these particles and we throw this in a, this kind of trap. And you can see that these oscillating or vibrating uh, dust particles, they are trapped in the electric field. So various trap geometries are being used today to trap these ion particle, charge particles. So these are the different uh, uh, trap designs. So one is known as linear quadrupole, 3D quadrupole. So this is all is the set of some electrodes, nothing else, no any complicated geometry kind of this thing. They have only applied some RF field with some uh, 20, 15, 20 megahertz of oscillating frequency and some 10, 20 DC voltages on their end cap electrodes, we call them. So these steps uh, can be now modeled in a different way. We call this surface traps because in, in only electrode traps, we can trap ions, 10, 20 trap ions in between these electrodes, but we cannot have the scalable level thing. So when we promise that ion traps are trapped ions can produce a scalable quantum computer, we have to just shift this kind of traps known as towards the a planar trap, or we call the surface ion trap chip designs. So you can see in this picture A that mm -hmm. this pole trap with simple quadrupole electrodes, now they're laid down in a one plane. So with the color coding, you can see that these RF electrodes over there and these gray electrodes are known as DC electrodes. So by applying same RF voltage on these electrodes, we can create a potential above the surface trap. Uh, above the surface of the chip, we say. And on that trapping region, we can trap ions. You can see in the picture B here. So this is the chain of ions which can be trapped. And this can be, uh, this is another type of thing. We can see that these electrodes are laid down in a plane. So here's another picture for the demonstration purpose. And in the last picture here, you can see that. So we have applied this DC voltages on side electrode or segmented DC electrodes some positive and negative potentials. So this creates the potential veil. And if we shuttle ion from one place to other place, transport ions from one region to another region, we just change the potential on these DC electrodes and ion can be moved from one direction to other direction. And these, uh, uh, using the existing microfabrication technology, we can design and we can fabricate these chips at very scalable level. So this is uh, kind of silicon dioxide Wafer thing, and then you electroplate or gold electroplate these uh, to uh, uh, photo uh, photo resistant thing. And then you can create this electro electrode structure at the size of uh, I would say in the micrometers range for 100 micrometer for 200 micrometer bit, and the gap between the electrodes just five to ten micrometers. So this is the real picture here, the, the size of the uh, chip. So once we apply RF field on it, here you can see that a pseudo potential, I would say pseudo potential is created above the surface. And here's the region where ions can be trapped, <coughs> the center of this pseudo potential. And on the other side, you can see this uh, graph of the plot of the pseudo potential with respect to ion height or ion position above the surface. So you can see that in this picture, for example, somewhere around 200, uh, you can see that uh, there's the RF nil position, we call it, and there the ions can be trapped. So these are some equations, how we can uh, simulate these things, because I'm called the pseudo potential, because it's the oscillating uh, 
uh, field which creates this kind of potential here. So this again trap depth. So this is defined in the way that a uh, minimum energy required for an ion to escape out of the trap. That is actually the difference between a potential difference between RF nil position and the escape point. So what is the escape point here? I can again show you this top. This is the escape point. This is the escape point. So this is the potential well created where we trapped the charged particles. So this is the real picture of an uh, surface trap. So this is actually at the scale, I would say it's about one or two centimeter. Okay, and these electrodes are hundreds of micrometers. And here, the real jitter beam ions, jitter beam ions are trapped. This is the chain of 10, 20 uh, jitter beam ions. The, the floor says when we apply some laser light on it, they start to uh, floor says. And that photons can be collected from a special uh, optical system and EMCCD cameras are used to image these ions. So going to talk about how we uh, trap ions. This is some schematic diagram in which we can see that here's the jitter beam oven. So oven actually melt these jitter beams and create uh, vapors. It may be jitter beam, maybe calcium, maybe some uh, kind of ions. So once it comes over the surface and then we apply a two photon ionization procedure. And this whole setup is under the vacuum and the vacuum is level is 10 power minus 11 millibar level. So here's the photo ionization technique. What we do that first of all, atoms is initialized in S2P ground state. When we apply a laser light of 399 nanometer and we excite atoms with 399 nanometer. And then we apply another photon at the wavelength of 369 nanometer, so which will ionize these atoms. So once these atoms are ionized, they immediately trapped because field is already there. So we, we just throw the, uh, we can say the beam of I atoms in that region and the lasers are crossing over there. So once lasers hit the ion, first they excite it and then it will uh, ionize it. So once they are trapped, the other thing you need to make sure that they come should in, come to the ground state level. For, for this thing, we call this technique the Doppler cooling and the laser cooling is known. We need number of lasers. So for example, this diagram, the celestate, first of all, we apply a 369 nanometer uh, photon or wavelength. So fit this will excite these ions, uh, these atoms or we can say electrons from S to P region, but it can fall in the D state. Again, because it's gone, it's, it's just away from the 369 wavelength, then we need another laser to excite, bring, bring this back into the cooling cycle. So it will excite to D, uh, to upper D, and then come back to S. But maybe with, due to the collision in the vacuum system, with collision with the, some atmospheric ion, uh, atoms, it can go in the D state, and from there it can fall into F state. Again, you need another wavelength, a laser, to bring this back into the cooling cycle. So once it comes cooling cycle again from 935 to again is to P region, which is the ground state of the jitter beam ion. So this is actually, you can note that that is 172. This is the even or uh, number of the jitter beam ion isotope, even isotope of the jitter beam. But for quantum computing stuff or cubic, we need 171 jitter beam because it has hyperfine states. So once you can see here that this laser cooling system gets more complicated when we are using 171 ions, or odd uh, isotope number uh, of the jitter beam. So here again, we have to excite, or maybe add side bands, we call this in our uh, laser tech, if you are aware of it. So we add side bands to the laser beams so that we excite these hyperfine uh, levels as well, to bring this, uh, to keep this ion in the cooling cycle. So now, as I told you that this is the criteria that the qubit should be uh, realized or started in a well-defined uh, initialization position. So we call this a state preparation here. So how we prepare the state like this, we apply magnetic field and this magnetic field will create again a Zeeman effect in the hyperfine structures. So we all side bands and lasers are on and then we can see that we just initialize initializing this ion in a well-defined uh, state. When we turn this off, ions may be in say, for example, in the zero prime start, or maybe ions 
can be in zero state. So if this is the zero state, so it won't flow states. For example, for detection thing, we just turn on one beam, which is in this state and all other side bands are off. So now if the ion is in this position, it will, it will flow states. It will emit out photons. But and we call it a, a bright ion. But if the ion was initialized in its zero state, it will consider the dark ion. So no photon will come it coming it out. So once we add, we uh, how we detect this, how we say read out this. So state preparation and measurement. So when if it is in the uh, no photon is coming out, we call it dark ion. It is initialized in the well defined state, or maybe it is starting to giving us floor sense in this uh, number of photons collected. We can see in the red graph here. So this region we can we call this ion is a bright ion. So this is all. Each histogram is just like five thousand repeated measurements because this is the quantum system. This is the random phenomena. So ultimately, we have a set of data points, and then we make a histogram. From histogram, we can say that either ion is in the dark state or maybe in the Right state. So this is just experimental setup here. Uh, just a scheme of the laser cooling system. You can see that which I talked about. We have a number of uh, laser beams. They are just passing through this surface trap or maybe any microscopic ion trap thing. So you can see that we have a, a 638 nanometer, 399 nanometer, 935 nanometer, and doubler system which makes 369 nanometer light. So all these lights coming from different uh, fibers lenses and the AOM, EOMs. So these are all about the, the, the experimental setup on the table. The other thing is that how we detect the photons, because we are just have the one single ion, single ion, single atom, or maybe a number of two or three atoms, not, nothing more. So they are just emitting out a very few number of photons per second, maybe five, maybe 10, maybe 100, like this, not more than that. So we have to be a very careful because these all photons which are coming out from it, needs to be collected. For the collection system, we call this imaging system. So in this uh, left graph, you can see that outside the vacuum chamber, we have a, a collecting photon collecting system. We call it imaging system, which is consists of different types of lenses known as triplet and doublet lenses. So once photons reach on these lenses, they will be collected and feed back towards the EMCCD or maybe PMT for different experiments and viewerization. So this is a real picture of the how this system was designed by me at University of Sussex. So here we have the full vacuum system here, a uh, lot of ion pumps and RGAs, sublimation, sublimation pumps are there. This is the vacuum chamber where our ion trap is mounted. So this is the macroscopic of the, I would say like uh, three centimeter by three centimeter uh, macro trap. And uh, it is capable to trap 10, 20 ions in a linear, position like this. So this is the real picture, which we trapped ions in this kind of uh, vacuum chambers. And the overall vacuum system size, I have mentioned here, just like one to two meter. But this is the actual picture of the laboratory here. You can see that a lot of lasers are coming, a lot of optics over there, some RF applying systems is there. So this is this picture, how this ion trap experiment looks like on the optical table. So now I'm moving towards the uh, chip designing of these quantum computers. So we know that this is a uh, slide taken from internet. We can see quantum computing abyss. So in this normally a state of the art experiment, which I just shown you, they can capable to trap 20 ions, 30 ions, 40 ions like this. And theoretical requirement for quantum useful quantum computer may be thousands of ions. So similarly, other parameter uh, uh, things are important for this uh, realization of the quantum computer, full scale quantum computation, like noise reduction, error correction. So new technology are there. We're looking for new technologies, efficient algorithms, and these things, people are working on it all around the globe. So first of all, scalability, because we need not three, four thousand, hundred ions are not sufficient. These qubits are not sufficient for this. We need to scalable these surface steps. And this is the potential, main potential of these kind of a trap design that is can, it can, they can trap thousands of ions. And these ions can move from one region to other region. So I'm going to demonstrate this here. So you can see this is the top view of the surface design. 
So here you can see a lot of X junctions, I would say junctions where uh, uh, ions can go forth from, from these regions and we can shuttle down, we can transport them from one location to other location. So they have to cross these junctions like T junction, like X junction, or maybe in Y junction. And people have demonstrated all these things. T junctions have been demonstrated, X junctions have demonstrated, Y junctions are demonstrated. So here, these are the uh, as design at Sussex that we maybe have some readout underneath the chip, because if you remember in my previous slides, what we did that we have the vacuum system and then we have the optical system outside the chamber to collect these photons. But for real quantum computers or scalable quantum computers, we have we would have a setup which collects photon directly underneath uh, its own. So it means we can see here in, in, in this picture, you can see the ion is floor sensing and the photons are being collected from the silicon photon counter thing. So once we trap ion, we can shuttle them from one position to other things. So here there's the simulations here. You can see uh, these are the RF electrodes and underneath there's the center, I would call it center segmented DC electrodes. So if we have apply some positive potential on electrode one, positive potential on the electrode three and some negative potential on electrode two, we can see that there's this potential veil created veil above the electrode number two. But when we apply the change the potential, as uh, uh, electrode three goes to the negative from the positive potential and electrode two goes from negative potential towards the positive potential. And we see that these ions can be shuttled from one region to other region. In this way, we can shuttle all these around the uh, uh, whole quantum, quantum scale chips. So this is the uh, uh, um, uh, simulations, how to construct a microwave trapped ion quantum computer. So just run this video and then we can, I can show you. So how this scalable quantum computer look like. So this is an ion surface trap. So first we have the loading zone, which I already described how we ionize ions. Once the ions are loaded, they can be shuttled around from one region to other region crossing this extension. Okay, so underneath is the current carrying wires for special purposes to uh, read out things sisters. And then these ions can be shuttled towards the detection zone. Here is the readout things would be carried out. We shine the lasers on it. They will emit out photons. They can be collected. And this, these things are happening all around this uh, one module. So ions are being shuttled from one region to other. They are read out. So this is the one module system. This is 36 by 36 X junction. So they are module uh, lower down in a module in a frame. It's a vacuum system actually. So they are being to be, to be aligned. And we have to shift ion from one region to other region. This is a bit difficult task. Uh, this difficult task. And now it has been demonstrated. I will show you next in the next slide. So now these are two modules, and in way in this way, we have hundreds of modules going to be fit in a vacuum system. So it can host 2.2 million X junctions. So again, similar thing. Okay, so in this way, a scalable quantum computer can be created. So first, uh, so, in this demonstration again, recently, because this paper they have published recently and in February. So what they have done, they have shown this thing, this shuttling of ion from one region to other region, from one module to other module. This is the real picture. This is the real ion, which are going to be shuttled from module one to module two. So this is the bright spot is a single atom. Once we change the potential, 
it cross one module to other module shuttle around so this is the paper they have published in nature communication uh, on february 20 so sussex my microwave ion trap quantum computer it is the one module is demonstrated we just copy paste all these things and can make a build a whole quantum computer scale this so this is all about uh, my talk and uh, it was just the introduction about quantum technology or uh, with the trap lines so now i would uh, request Ms. Karatik ball my student she will talk about trapped ion as magnetic field sensors so is that okay Kirat? Uh, yes, sir, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Can I share my screen? Uh, sure. Uh, first of all, I have to stop sharing. Okay. Yes, Kirat, you can share, please. Yes, sir. So uh, I am Kerat Iqbal from University of Sin, and uh, I am working on one of the major applications of uh, trapped ions, which is quantum magnetic sensing. Uh, as uh, Dr. Altav already discussed in detail about the trapped ions, so um, let's just see how these trapped ions can work as quantum sensor uh, and how it is better than other quantum sensors. So let's uh, start with the very basics. Uh, quantum sensor utilizes the properties of quantum mechanics, such as quantum entanglement, quantum interference, and quantum superposition. These properties make the sensor ultra sensitive as it beats the uh, limits in current sensor technology and provides high precision level. So the principle of the quantum sensor is very uh, familiar with us, the Zeeman effect. Uh, so the trapped ions or atoms themselves can serve as sensor because the magnetic field affect their level energies. We, everybody knows here. And the measurement of the transition frequencies can be used to reduce the magnetic field. And the method of the sensing realized on the proposal made by Baumgart. So here you can see uh, these are the fine structures of a euterbium ion uh, before the application of magnetic field. And as we are applying some external magnetic field B, so these energy level has been splitted. So this is splitting of the degenerated states after the application of magnetic field is known as bare states. So the use of bare states only causes certain problems, like fluctuations due to the ambient magnetic field causes defacing and reduces coherence time. Uh, what happens when we use bare states, you can see here, this is the graph, which is clearly showing that using the bare state will, uh, of course, cause some problems. The probability of finding ion in F1 state would reduce as the time is increasing. As the time passes, the probability of finding the ion is uh, uh, decreasing and the ion is going into mixed state. So to overcome this problem, we have a solution. We can use some dress states instead of the qubits formed by bare Zeeman states. So what are these dress states? These dress states are the coupling of transitions by application of some external magnetic, uh, some external fields. So let's just simplify this. Uh, there are two pictures on the left side, it's RF dressing fields and the right side is microwave dress fields. What happens, uh, for example, I'm interested in sensing some RF signal, uh, some RF field. So I will couple, uh, I will apply an external source of microwave and will couple these plus one and minus one, two transition with this transition. And this uh, green arrow is showing the, uh, the range of the signal which is to be detected. Now, now I'm interested in sensing uh, some microwaves, not the RF. So just same, uh, using the same technique, I am just going to couple these transition with this transition. And now this is this green arrow is the signal, uh, is the external signal, is it, which is in the range of gigahertz. This is the signal uh, that is to be detected. So this is how using the dress state we can uh, sense the magnetic field of our interest. So using the dress states, you can see uh, this plot, which is showing that after the, after the application of dressing fields, uh, the um, probability of finding the ion is increased. And even after 4,000 microseconds, the ion is uh, not going into any decoherence, further its uh, coherence time has been increased. So the cyclic behavior of the two-level quantum system in the presence of the oscillating driving field is known as Rabi flops. And the strength of the magnetic field uh, that has to be sensed, it depends on the Rabi flop frequencies. So uh, of course, these type of sensors are ultra-high sensitive. 
this is the formula that is used to find uh, that is used to calculate the sensitivity of a magnetic sensor uh, and the sensitivity is inversely proportional to bohr's magnetron and uh, it's inversely proportional to the square of the uh, uh, coherence time which is t2 and the total time which is total measurement time and n n is the number of trap lines so using a single trap line uh, we can attain a sensitivity of 4 pico tesla per root hertz for an ac current and this sensitivity can further be enhanced by increasing the number of trap lines. As uh, we can see, the sensitivity is inversely proportional to the square root of the number of trap lines. But this sensitivity can uh, further more increase as we are entangling those trap lines. Now you can see the sensitivity of the entangled trap lines is inversely proportional to the number of trap lines. So this is how we can increase the sensitivity of our ion trap magnetic sensor. So basically, these type of sensors are very sensitive to magnetic fields. Uh, it ranges from pico Tesla to sub pico Tesla range. Further, they are tunable as we have discussed about the dress state. So using the dress state and uh, uh, we can sense the mag uh, magnetic field of our interest, which ranges from uh, static DC static fields to hundreds of megahertz uh, or even in gigahertz in some special settings. So this property of an intra magnetometers enables them to be tunable in a long frequency range. This is the most interesting feature of the sign trap uh, sensor. Uh, this ion trap sensor can work as a gradiometer. So what happens? We can trap, we can create multiple trapping regions, uh, the as this as discussed by Dr. That we can create multiple trapping regions, uh, regions, and by mapping the magnetic field in each region, we can make a, a magnetic sensor to work as a magnetic radiometer. And the size of the given the size of the trap geometry is ranges in micrometer. Its a special resolution can be enhanced from uh, some millimeters to millimeters. And yes, this the these. These designs can uh, uh, be used to uh, sense magnetic field even in three dimensions that I will discuss later. So here are some of the key features of an ion trap magnetometer. It's ultra high sensitive. Of course, it ranges from uh, pico Tesla to uh, hundreds of femto Tesla range. It can work as a gradiometer in the range of pico Tesla per millimeters. It is tunable as it has a lock-in feature for the selection of frequencies of interest. Uh, which has, which we have discussed. It can work as a microwave detector. Uh, again, uh, using the addressing states, we can make it to work as a microwave detector in some specific frequency ranges. Further, it is portable. It, it does not need heavy shieldings and uh, a room full of lasers, things like that. So it's a portable device. It, and it can be converted into atomic clock. So uh, you might be thinking that uh, there are many other quantum sensors which uh, provides a uh, femto Tesla range and they're ultra high sensitive. So uh, of course, there are many other sensors that provides a uh, femto Tesla per root hertz range of sensitivity. For example, we have a squeeze, we have uh, uh, AM uh, atomic magnetometers, uh, optical atomic magnetometers or MV centers, and there are many other quantum sensors. So to answer this question, I have uh, I did a comparison of different quantum magnetometers in different frequency range. So here you uh, can see if uh, I am uh, if I just look at AM Weber cells. So you can see it provides good sensitivity in the range of femto Tesla, but in the in low frequency ranges, as the external sig uh, the frequency of the external signals is increasing in the range of megahertz. So the AM vapor cell does not uh, provide good results or reliable results. And in gigahertz, its sensitivity drops uh, and its sensitivity is very poor in gigahertz range. Similarly, if I just uh, look at uh, so NV centers, so it does not provide good sensitivity in either low or in high frequency range. But if I just talk about uh, trap dynes, 100 ATOBM trap dynes, so it provides hundreds of femto Tesla per root hertz sensitivity in low frequency range. And as we are increasing the frequency range, you can see there is still the uh, sensitivity of the trap dyne magnetic sensor is very high in the range of tens of pico Tesla. And uh, in the range of gigahertz, it is still has a good sensitivity in tens of pico Tesla. So let's just summarize it. Uh, if I'm interested in sensing low frequency ranges, so EM vapor cells are good. But if uh, someone is interested in sensing high frequency range, so trap dynes are very best. This is another comparison. 
uh, it is the comparison of different quantum magnetic sensors, uh, the size, uh, the, their dimensions versus their sensitivity. So there are many different quantum sensors like uh, BECs, vapor cells, ensembles. So I'm just uh, taking the example of this squid. As you can see, this squid, everybody knows here that it provides very uh, good sensitivity. You can see in the range of hundreds of femtotesla. But if we just look at its dimensions, its size is more than a millimeter. Okay, let's just reduce its size. Let's miniaturize it. So as its size is decreasing, its sensitivity is dropping too. Same happens with other sensors. If they are providing good sensitivity, so their dimensions uh, are high. And if we are just trying to miniaturize the sensors, so their sensitivity drops. But if we just look at this portion, uh, the trapped dynes or entangled pair of trapped dynes, it provides good sensitivity in the range of Pico Tesla. And uh, it has uh, good sensor sizes in the range of hundreds of nanometers. So basically, these uh, trapped dyne magnetic sensors provide good sensitivity. Uh, with good dimensions and uh, in every frequency range they can be operated. So here are some of the trap chip designs for portable ion trap magnetometer. Uh, so using the techniques, uh, uh, same techniques uh, told by Dr. Altaf, I have designed here our two zone ion trap designs. You can see these are the RF electrodes and the DC electrodes. The combination of RF and DC electrode has created a potential well inside which this red dot is showing the ion, which is which has been trapped over the surface of these chips. If I just look at the cross-sectional view of this chip, so this is the contour plot, uh, which is uh, showing the two trapping regions above the surface of the chip. It will create a potential well like this over the surface of the chip. And these ion will be trapped inside this potential well in this manner. So this is how it works. So uh, again, the use of the its major significant its significant feature the scalability. So I have further extended this design into four regions. Uh, this is a top view, and this is the three D view of the four uh, trapping zones uh, ion trap chip. You can see the perfect combination of RF and DC electrodes has created this type of potential well in this manner over the surface of the chip. Okay. And this is how ions will be confined inside it. Uh, okay, now uh, I discussed that uh, my designs are capable to map magnetic field in all three dimensions. So mapping magnetic field in two dimensions in various zones, uh, we can sense magnetic field in two dimensions. So what about the third dimension? We can sense magnetic field in third dimension too through vertical shuttling. So what is this vertical shuttling? Vertical shuttling is simply the process in which ions can move upward or in downward direction uh, relative to the so, uh, surface of the electron. So there are various methods to shuttle the ion, some geometrical factors, uh, by, for example, by varying the width of RF electrodes or some electrical factors by applying uh, small voltages on the central ground electrode. So we have used a lighter method here, which is the application of voltages on the ground electrode. So uh, this is the cut view. Uh, this is the cross-sectional view of our trapping chip. Uh, a ground electrode is sandwiched between two RF electrodes, and this is the ion height. Ion is trapped at a certain distance from the surface of these electrodes. But as I'm applying some voltages, so the ion is shuttling downward. As you can see, I have applied small voltage on the ground electrode, and the ion is shuttling downward. So this is how we can map magnetic field in all three dimensions. There's another uh, demonstration. These are the plots. Uh, this is the plot of trapping potential. When there was no uh, voltage on the ground electrode, the voltages were zero. So this is how the ions would trap, and this is the ion height. Now I have applied some voltage, which is 40 volts on the ground electrode. Now ion is just uh, shifted a bit down. Then I've increased voltage, now 80 volts on the ground electrode. This is how the ion is shuttling downward. Finally, on 100 volts, you can see the visible difference in ion height as I'm increasing the voltages on the ground electrode. I've plotted this. Uh, so you see here, as we are increasing the voltages, the ion height is uh, decreasing and ion is shuttling downward. So this is uh, the experimental setup also shown by Dr. Altaf. Uh, it, uh, you have seen that it is a big room full of lasers, components, equipments, too many computers. 
so of course uh, uh, you cannot carry this whole room with uh, you to sense magnetic field that is why uh, we are working on a surface ion trap chip design for a portable magnetic sensor this is the device which was designed at university of sussex this is a portable magnetic sensor its dimensions are uh, you can see 30 by 20 centimeters approximately a size of a shoe box so this is a portable uh, magnetic sensor and the chip uh, the sensing chip would be placed inside this vacuum chamber over here so this type of magnetic sensors has of course very uh, too many applications but especially in the field of defense it is very reliable and uh, uh, effective so we can detect drones radars submarines steel pipelines or buried ferromagnetic objects NQR, which is the drugs or nuclear uh, non-destructive nuclear uh, non-destructive explosive detection, absolute frequency measurements, and microwave atomic clock. There are uh, there are also uh, many other applications. Further, Doctor Altaf would conclude uh, this talk. Okay, so thank you very much, Kirat. So yes, house is open for question and answer session. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? Hey, um, hi. you mentioned that. Hi. Yeah, you mentioned that you have uh, long coherence times for your ion-based qubits. What? Why is that uh, exactly? It's about uh, uh, people have demonstrated up to twenty seconds as well, up to twenty seconds. Okay. And is, what, is there like any particular reason for this resilience or? Uh, because uh, these traps are, for example, when we trap ions over the surface traps, it's a lot of uh, noise coming from the electrodes as well, our surrounding noise. Actually, the, vacu mm -hmm. uh, the, the ions are under the vacuum, okay? But uh, yeah. still, how good the vacuum is, still there are some mm -hmm. atoms that can collide with these atoms, these trapped atoms or charged atoms. So then the decoherence de de times reduces. But still 20 seconds have been demonstrated and that's more than enough because we do uh, readout and preparation in milliseconds time. So that's more than enough. Does, does that account for when you shut yeah. the ions into other chips as well? Yes. Okay. So it's, it's mainly down to how good your vacuum and cooling technology is. Exactly, exactly. And, and the, the other thing is there, which is not mentioned here, which is known as heating rate. Actually, the surface traps have some built-in uh, noise inside it, how good the electric field is over there, but it's still, they induce some heating in the ions. So their ground state changes to the excited states. And heating rate, uh, we will maybe uh, mention here, because uh, I think right now, I think it is about something, uh, 20 quantas per millisecond has been demonstrated in these uh, surface ion traps. So this is the limiting point. For this T2 time. Oh, thank you. Yep. Okay, Other questions? So I'm actually curious about uh, the material um, uterbium. Um, yeah. So what's special about this uh, this atom? It's uh, nothing basic. special. Uh, actually, uh, calcium, people are using calcium ions. This is alkali like atom. So once we ionize them, we have the single electron its valence uh, shell. So that's the reason. And actually the transitions from H to P, P to D, which I demonstrated the laser cooling stuff. So these wavelength lasers are available commercially, actually. So that's the main reason oh, to see. select different uh, ions. So it's see. only market uh, or anything, thing, which uh, lasers are available, you go for that and particularly. It sounds good. And also uh, when you were describing in that video, um, how to read, um, to read out the, the process. Can you um, tell us a little more how, how you read, uh, read out the quantum process in the... Uh, can I share again? Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, so you cannot share a screen while other person... I think, uh, Kirat, can you turn off your sharing stuff? Kirat, can you can you hear me? Okay.
So read out in this video, yeah? Yes. Uh, maybe somewhere. So how does the reading occur and, and okay, here. which access, yeah. So actually, uh, I told you in the big experimental setup, what we do, we we shine the laser on these ions and see that it is in which state in hyper it is f, f equal to zero or in f equal to one state. So we shine a laser. So when we shine it, it if the photons are coming out, we can say it is in state one. If the, there's the, no, nothing is coming out from it, we call it like the ion is in the ground state. So the photons coming out from it. So normally we have the uh, optical system outside the chamber, vacuum chamber, and we have the lenses to collect these photons. But right now in these kind of uh, surface type lens, we are looking for that. There's some, there must be something underneath over it, maybe some photo detector material, a photo detector, a photon detector stuff inside the chip. The one of the electrode is, is just like a fiber thing which can collect these photons underneath it and then they feed back towards the PMT or photomultiplier tube thing to, to collect these photons from it. So this is the way uh, people are designing these kind of modules. I see, very interesting, thank you. Um, any other questions? Okay, if not, let's thank uh, Dr. Nizamani and uh, Kirat for the very nice talks.